Statistics, hypothesis testing, T distribution, one tail upper, where the standard deviation of the population is not known. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one, because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section 1982 hypothesis testing T distribution one tail upper STDP not known tab. This scenario is similar to recent scenarios, except this time we're looking at hypothesis testing instead of confidence intervals, T distribution instead of normal distribution where we have a one tail situation instead of a two tail situation, it's an upper rather than a lower tail and the standard deviation of the population is not known, which is why or one reason why we might be using a T distribution as opposed to the normal distribution. We'll talk more about all that shortly. However, the similarities will be that we have uh, an information that we want to find about a population. We can't test every item within the population. It's just too large. So we take a sample and then we hope that we can apply the findings we find from the sample to the characteristics of the larger population. Two typical methods for doing this. One, hypothesis testing. Two, confidence intervals. Confidence intervals lending themselves to situations where we don't know what the middle point is. Therefore, we take the sample and then we take the mean of the sample, that being our middle point, we then construct the graph around that middle point or have some kind of confidence interval calculation based on that middle point. With hypothesis testing, which is what we will be looking at here, we're gonna say that we do know what the middle point is or what we think it ought to be. We will then construct the graph around basically what that middle point is and then we're gonna actually take the sample and see what we get from the sample to see how far away the sample mean is from the middle point. Is it far enough away for us to reject the null hypothesis? The structure therefore being similar to a United States criminal court case where if we have a court case, it's probably because there's some suspicion of guilt. That's why you have the court case most likely. However, you're going to set up the process so that the assumption is innocence. That's the null hypothesis. And then only upon gathering a preponderance of information sufficient to determine guilt, would you have a guilty verdict versus the default uh, innocent verdict. Same kind of structure that we have here. The null hypothesis is what we think it should be. And then do we have enough evidence based on the sample that's far enough away from it for us to reject the null hypothesis. Now, when we do this, sometimes we're gonna have a normal distribution, which is what we typically think of in these scenarios. But if we don't have enough information about the data in the population, such as the standard deviation of the population, the measure of the spread, then it's likely that we might switch over to T distributions, which are gonna have the same bell-shaped nature to it, except the tails are gonna be fatter which is kind of what you would expect because that's gonna to lead to a, a larger interval necessary to get the same amount of coverage under uh, the curve. So for example, if we were looking at a two tail scenario, we would imagine that we'd have two tails and let's just imagine they were two standard deviations on each side about 1.96 about would give you about 95% of the area of the curve under uh, under 
two standard deviations if it was a normal distribution and if you had a two-tail scenario meaning 2.5 would be under the area on each side of uh, the curve now if we look at t distributions the tails are wider that would mean in order to get that same 95 percent we would have to go out further than two standard deviations in terms of t's instead of z's uh, in, in this case, because we're going to have Z's will be standard deviations. Now we're going to have T's for uh, the T distribution. Or within the same two standard deviations, we would have less than 95% would be the general uh, idea. So that's one thing we basically want to be keeping in mind. The next is that oftentimes we have... Oh, that's good advice. I could scribble over it. I got it. Let's try that. I could scribble over it. No, I have to have the eraser. Okay, whatever. All right, so now the next thing to, to basically keep in mind uh, is that do we have a one tail, a two tail? And if it's a one tail, is it upper or a lower situation? So clearly, usually we think about a two tail scenario and we often choose 5% as the amounts in the tails where the data would have to be for us to reject the null hypothesis. But if we have a one tail situation and we still choose like 5%, now that whole 5% is going to be in this one tail, which means even if we had like a normal bell curve, this line right here, this critical value would not be exactly two standard deviations above because this area of this curve has twice as much in it, right? So it's going to be less than that if it was uh, the, the normal type of distribution. So in our case, we're going to imagine that we have an old machine that makes so many widgets uh, within a time frame, say an hour. And then we're thinking about buying a new machine. And the question is, is the new machine more efficient than the old machine? How would we set up the, the process? We're going to then imagine that the mean of the new machine will be the same, the middle point. So we're hoping it's not. We're hoping it's faster because that's why we would purchase the new machine. But we're going to set the default hypothesis that it is the same to see if we can get a preponderance of evidence to show that it's significantly outside the range of the old machine in order to possibly uh, justify the purchase. And so then we're going to basically say that we have the one tail. It has to be our sample has to clear this critical value in order for us to then say that it is substantially faster or we think it is faster or makes more widgets than the old machine. That's why we have the one tail upper. We don't care if it's down here. It's not a two tail test because I don't care if it's less efficient. It might be, but if it's less efficient, if it makes less widgets, then it's out of the picture. We don't care about that, that point. We only care about this point. All right, that's the general idea. Let's go on back and see what we've got here. So I'm going to zoom in just a bit. All right, so we have the hypothesis testing so the the production of the old machine we're going to say it makes nine 293 let's say just widgets i know that's very generic but that's what the machine produces i, I imagine a dr seuss machine that produces widget wazzles it's or whatever the dr seuss machine makes so the company's perspective is we're, we can imagine a scenario we were thinking about buying a new machine is it worth the capital investment for us to purchase the new machine it could be multiple things involved such as the quality of the items and so on and so forth but one factor might be does it make the widgets faster or not so that's what we're going to be asking does the new widget uh the new widget production machine make more widgets per let's say hour so how would we set up our test if we're doing hypothesis testing although we assume which is the reason we're doing the test that the new machine is going to be faster we're going to set up the system as though in a court case saying that the new machine is going to be the same efficiency as the old machine it has to prove that it's beating the old machine meaning we're going to use the null assumption as the old machine's output number so the the alternative then hypothesis would be the conclusion if the null hypothesis is rejected which in our case because it's a one tail upper only and not doesn't include the lower means that it produces more widgets if it produces less widgets we don't care so then this is going to be our formula for the 
the we'll, we'll get into that later standard error so then we're, we're going to imagine in excel now we do this in excel in another course or section but those are longer presentations we'll just give you some idea of how you might construct this in excel you might first try to set up the data so i'm going to set up some data that will represent the actual population which is the behind the scenes information that we're imagining that we know but isn't known in universe so we're going to build our data around a mean of 300 and the standard deviation of the population of six we would use the data analysis if you're in excel and you don't have that turned on you can turn it on look it up chat gtp or whatever you can check out to turn that on and then we have the data analysis we're just going to do a random generation but the random generation is not is not going to be completely random because it's going to be normally distributed meaning bell shirt bell curve type of data spread around the center point which we said was 300 and a standard deviation which measures the spread of six that gives us our data over here so here's the actual data that we're imagining that that spit out for us here's the actual data if i was to graph the data it looks something like this which is a little wonky but this is a histogram showing that the data is somewhat bell-shaped now remember in our situation we're imagining we do not know the standard deviation of the population which in some cases we might have a general idea because we might know the standard deviation of the old machine and assume that the standard deviation is somewhat similar to the old machine given the fact that we would expect the machine to have an error rate that might be similar right even if it makes more widgets but we might not know that and we might say that we don't we want to assume we don't know that so then if we take a sample we have a question of especially if the sample size is small do we have enough information for the central limit theorem to kick in for us to have to be able to use the bell-shaped curve so it is particularly important if we have a small sample size and we don't know the standard deviation possibly to use the t distribution and even then if the sample size is small uh, we would hope that the actual data this actual data would approximate a bell-shaped curve which will help us to have results that should correlate to a bell-shaped curve situation even though the central limit theorem might not have fully kicked in given the fact that our sample size is small the larger the sample size then the more the t distribution graphs will have skinnier tails and look more like a uh, normal type of distribution so those are just a couple things kind of to, to, to keep in mind if we're looking at a small sample size where we don't know the standard deviation of the population now this is the same data but we just rounded it because oftentimes maybe if I'm trying to count the widgets and they gave me decimals and I'm saying well I'm not going to count a partial widget so I just took all of this data and we rounded it to whole numbers here using a round function to zero digits so I'm going to use this actual data now I'm going to actually give me that information about that data by doing a count this would be a large n oftentimes representing the actual population 500 numbers we made so we're going to imagine a population of 500 remembering that if we actually bought the machine we might be making far more than 500 widgets but the 500 is just large enough for us to have an actual population that we can take a sample from so that we can see on our end what the actual population really is and then do the sample and make a comparison so then we're going to say that the the mean population is going to be the average so now we took the average of this we got a mean we input around 300 but the average number is 299 that makes sense that's pretty close and the standard deviation of the population which is this formula stdev.p is 6.08 all right so we're going to imagine that we don't know this information in universe but this is the actual information of of the data of the the new uh uh machine we're going to imagine so now we're going to do what we would do in universe meaning we're going to take a sample of the machine in practice of course this would mean that we would run the new machine multiple times to see how many widgets it makes let's say like in an hour or something like that right so then so so we we would run the machine now in our example 
what we want to do is, is simulate this. How would we simulate it in Excel? Well, I could just take the first so many of these numbers. We're going to take a sample size of 15 because we randomly generated these. Or if I had a list of numbers that represent the population, which I want to take a random number generation from, I could create another column making a random number column and sort by that column, which would shuffle the, the numbers like a deck of cards. Or I could use an index function, which is what this is, which is taking the index of that, those numbers, that's the range, and then adding a random between, which is telling us which, which row to grab from, randomly pick between row one and row 500. And that gives us our sample. So either way you think about it, in universe, we ran it, we ran the test 15 times. Uh, in Excel, we did a random generation from the 500 number population to get 15 numbers out of the 500. Okay, so then based on that, we can rewrite, this is just a rewrite of our hypothesis test. H sub zero or H naught, of, of mu, which represents the mean, meaning the average point or center point of our data is going to be 293. That's what we're assuming because that's what the output of the old machine is. And we want to see if it's less than or equal, then we, we're going to say that we're not going to buy the new machine. The, whole, the, the, the null hypothesis would stand. It's only if the alternative hypothesis, H sub A, has a mu, meaning the mean, uh, is greater than 293. So if it's substantially greater than 293 in our testing, that's when we would reject the null hypothesis and accept that the machine does produce substantially more than the 293. All right. So let's go ahead and break out this information. We're going to say then that the sample size, we did a sample of 15. I can test that by counting a count formula of this data. We did 15 of them. So that's a pretty small sample, which means that we're hoping, which is again, another reason that we're using T distributions as opposed to normal distributions and hoping that the actual data has a bell shape to it, which will make the data more accurate because even without the central limit theorem, it still has a bell-shaped character to it. The degrees of freedom. This number is not used if we had a normal distribution, but is used if we have T distributions because it helps to determine what graph we're going to be using. Now, remember the normal distribution is always the normal distribution graph with, with basically 95% of the data in about two standard deviations or 1.96. But the T distributions are actually a whole set of different graphs, which are dependent upon the degrees of freedom. So we have to determine what the degrees of freedom are to pick the right graph. If you do this in Excel, Excel picks the graph, but you have to kind of know that you're not using the same graph in terms of how much is it within two standard deviations, for example, under the curve, because it will change depending on the degrees of freedom, which is calculated as the sample size minus the number of samples. In our case, we just had one sample, therefore 15 minus one is 14. So then we have the X bar, which is the mean of the sample. So the mean, remember when we're thinking about this, we have, we could think about the mean of the data, which we don't, uh, we don't know, because that's, that's, we don't know that in universe, we know that out of universe, we have our our hypothesis of what that mean is, which is 293, which is the mean of the old machine. And that's, but that's going to be our hypothesis. And then we have the mean of the sample, which is the sample of the new machine, which should tend towards the mean of the population. And then we can imagine the mean of all possible combinations, the mean of all, <laughs> the mean of all the mean combinations of uh, sample size 15, which is the data that we're actually using to create our, our bell curve. All of those numbers, well, the, the mean of the population, the mean of the sample, and the mean of all combinations of means of the samples of sample size n should tend towards the mean of the actual population. So we're going to just take the average of the population that comes out to 297.07.
and then we're going to say alpha is 0.03. Alpha represents the area of the tail. So remember, if it's a two tail test, we often choose five, you know, as a default. It's a, it's a, just a choice that we make. If it was two tails, that would mean that 2.5 would be on either side of the tail. In this case, we only have a one tail test. So if we chose five, all five would be on this side of the tail. So we're going to choose 0.3. So, so, that, so that's what's going to be the area under the, uh, of that side of the tail. And so if we're over that side of the tail, that's when we would uh, reject the standard deviation of the sample. So the standard deviation, you will recall once again that this graph has two things we need to graph it. The middle point, which is going to be the hypothesized number, and then the standard deviation, which isn't the standard deviation of the population. It's not the standard deviation of the sample. It's, it's the standard deviation that we imagine of, all, of the mean of all possible combinations of samples of sample size 15 right because that's the number where the central limit theorem will be likely to kind of kick in now to calculate that however the standard error uh we're gonna we're gonna need the standard deviation of either the population or the sample now in our example we don't know what the standard deviation of the population is we have an idea of it because this is the behind the scenes number 6.08 if i knew it then I would use that to calculate my standard error calculation. But if I don't know what it is, then I'm going to approximate it with the standard deviation of the sample, 8.04 versus the 6. So it's a pretty substantially different number here, which we're going to compensate for a bit by using the T distribution as opposed to the normal distribution. Okay, so that's going to be calculated in Excel with the standard deviation of the sample of our are 15 numbers here all right and then we've got the standard error this is the standard deviation the measure of spread that we're actually going to use to to build our graph to build our graph around and so that calculation is the formula and represents basically all combinations of sample of whatever sample size in our case 15 uh, uh 15 so we use this formula to calculate it so you'd, you'd put in this formula. I'm, I'm removing the second bit over here. So it's just S over the square root of N. So S would be the standard deviation of the population, but because it's not known, S is representing the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of N, and N is the sample size, in our case, 15. So this calculation, I won't do it here because the calculators are kind of messy with the square root and whatnot, but we're taking... We're taking the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the sample size 15. And so here's the, here's the formula, this divided by square root of that. And then we're going to say, okay, then let's take a look at our T test. So, 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 so now remember, what does this mean? The test statistic. So this graph we're imagining is built on the middle point of the of of the the null hypothesis so that's what the middle point is so the middle point of this graph we are imagining to be the two the 293 and then we're and then we came up to an actual number of the mean of 297 so now the question is how far away is the 297 from the 293 we could measure that in x's or we can measure it in standard deviations, which are basically in units of standard error in our case, which normally would be called the Z, the Z scores. But in this case, because we're using T distributions are going to be the T's. All right. So that would be calculated something like this. We'd say we would just say this is this is what we came to 297.07. That's our mean minus the middle point of the graph 293 is a difference of 4.07 in like x's but we're going to divide that by the standard deviation which is the standard error about 2.07586 and that gives us our 1.959 or so so you'll recall that around two standard deviations if it was a normal distribution would would two standard deviations on the high and low end would be about 95% of the data in the middle.
but now we're using t distributions which are a little bit wider so that so that 1.9 would be pretty far in terms of of uh uh z's but it's not quite as far in terms of the t's given the 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 graph but it's calculated the same way the difference is going to be on the area under the curve of the graph because the graph is going to have those wider tails for a t distribution all right so then we can calculate the uh the p value so the p value uh is going to be what we're trying to figure what we're trying to figure here is the area of the graph after this point so if i look at this point 1.95 so if i was up here like 1.95 or so and i drew my line here the question is what is the area after that point of the tail of the graph and if it's less than the tail of this bit which is the part of our critical value less than 0.03 then that means that the, the line would have been over here the tail would have been smaller so we, we're going to look we're going to we're going to reject if this number is less than our alpha 0.03 which it's not it's close it's quite close but it's just not so the calculation is going to be one minus because we're looking at the upper end the upper tail otherwise it would be measuring the lower tail t dot dist and then we're going to be picking up the x which is a little funny because we're picking up that 1.95 there and then the degrees of freedom which is the sample size 15 minus one sample or 14 and then is it cumulative it is cumulative that's the formula to get this 0.0351 which is less than barely the alpha which means that given the alpha level of 0.03 we don't have enough evidence if we had the alpha level at 0.05 then we would right if it's, it's really close but at that level of confidence we're saying it's not the evidence isn't there so then what if this was a normal distribution then the formula would look like this it would be one minus to get to the top of the tail norm dot s dot dist of the z which is the same number the t the, the test statistic is calculated the same whether we call it a t which is used for t distributions or a z if used for normal distributions and then is it cumulative yes it's going to be a one so notice this number is 0.025 so we get a slightly different number given the fact that we're using a different curve and the the normal distributions have thinner tails than the t distribution okay so let's take a look at the critical value the critical value represents this point that we have to clear to get so if my number if my number came out out here then i would have to reject the null hypothesis i can measure that in x's but now i'm measuring it in what used to be called t's standard deviations which now with a t test we call t's so so the calculation here is simply going to be then this one it's going to be at t dot inverse it's going to be one minus because once again we're looking at the upper part of the graph the probability now we're looking at this probability alpha because we're looking at the area we know the area of the graph that we set to be 0.03 and then degrees of freedom which will give us the graph that we want for the t distribution is 14 and that's at 2.046 so at 2.046 uh we're, we're no, we should get to the same result of not rejecting it so we're we're not at the point of rejection why because the test uh, statistic is not past the critical value it did not go past the hurdle uh rate so okay so just a quick recap here's the hurdle rate we're inside the hurdle rate just barely and therefore we can't reject it if we were past the hurdle rate then now because we're inside the hurdle rate the area of the curve from here to the tail is greater than the area of the curve of this orange plate if we were past the hurdle rate then then this number would be higher than the hurdle rate and the area of the curve from the hurdle from from our number to this bit would be less than the this area the orange area so that's how those two late those two kind of correlate to each other two ways to same kind of the same thing whether we reject it uh or not
And then this would be the same calculation with a normal curve, norm.s.inverse. If it was normal instead of t distributions, one minus the probability of 0.03. You'll notice because of the t distributions having a fatter tail, we come up with a, a different number. The t distribution hurdle rate is further out because this tail is thinner out there and the, the normal distribution is going to be in closer. Okay. So we're going to say, all right, let's go ahead and see. We graph this. Here's the T's. I'm taking T's of negative four on up in the same rationale as we've seen in our graphing before is that if we measure the X's, the X bar here in T values, which are equivalent to Z values, if it was a normal distribution, you'll recall that if it were a normal distribution, about 95% of the data is within two standard deviations. Four standard deviations encompasses almost all of the data. Although the T distribution has thicker tails, that's still pretty much the case. We can get basically the whole graph within about four standard deviations. Therefore, I'm going from negative four to positive four. The X is going to be the conversion of the T's to X's because I'm going to have an X graph down here which can be converted either in terms of t's which were equivalent to v's before which are the standard deviations or to x's which in our case is the number of widgets that conversion calculation would simply be the four standard deviations times the standard error which is the the unit of the standard deviations used to graph and it's going to be 2.07586 and then we're going to take that plus uh, actually, I'm going to say minus the middle point of the graph, which is the mean minus the 293. We're using that, not this. We didn't graph around this point. We graphed around the hypothesized middle point. Let's see if I got that right. Uh, to, yeah, about 285 if we round it. So that's going to be the X. And then the P of X is going to be calculated as T dot dist of x which is a little confusing because that's the x the t here and then this degrees of freedom which was 14 in our formula and then is it cumulative we're going to say no zero that gives us our percentages and then this is going to give us the tail and i'm saying everything where t is above that 2.05 which is our critical value 2.05 about so everything above that, which means I don't have the data here because it's blank until I get to the high part of the graph where you get out into this tail. That's the orange bit. So if we graph this out, then let's see if I can zoom in a bit here. See if I can see the middle point around zero at the peak of the graph should be around here. So that would be zero in terms of T's, which are equivalent to Z's in terms of uh, it's it's uh, in terms of X's. It's the 293 widgets, which is our hypothesized value, the value that the old machine made. And then we're saying up here, here's the critical value, which in terms of standard deviations, we determined to be, scroll down a bit, we determined it to be 2.046 standard deviations. So we're gonna say, all right, that's that, is that right? Around, 2.046 okay i think that's about right and then if we converted that to to uh to x's which we could find 2.046 here and look at the related x it would be around here on the graph so that's like 297 or so widgets and then what we got in our sample was uh was two two ninety seven, which had which had a test statistic of one point nine five. So two ninety seven is like two ninety seven. I'm like right here and one point nine five. So here it is one point nine five. So notice we were just inside. So we're just barely inside. We're not. We don't have quite enough evidence to move out here in order to reject uh, the null hypothesis is the general idea, uh, the general conclusion. Okay.